Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. I'm joined by some very special guests today. We have Eric Johnson here, we have Kyle Brock, and we have Tommy Taylor. Thanks for coming in, guys. Appreciate you being here. Great. Yeah. Great to be here. Eric, you're going to get tired of seeing me, man. This is like our third interview. Oh, it's great. A few no, months or... <laughs> I'm happy to be back. It's always nice to come here. Yeah, well, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. And I was thinking today it might be kind of fun to take a trip back through time and talk about Avia Musicom because you guys are out touring the album. You're playing it. Uh, in its entirety, and uh, I'd be, uh, I can't remember my breakfast yesterday, but I'm hoping you guys can jump back uh, oh, 30 man. years or so and, and uh, fill us in on what was happening when the album was being made. So tell us about, first of all, tell us about the tour and how you decided to go out and play the, uh, the album as a whole. Well, um, it was a nice excuse for Kyle and Tommy out to play t together as a band. Um, it was just like, uh, we were just talking one day and thought, well, how, how would be a cool way to do a tour? And um, it was mentioned to me that a lot of people are doing, well, you know, a lot of people are doing, like, they'll take one of their records and they'll play the whole record live. And I thought, yeah, it's got kind of like this novel idea that a lot of people have been doing. I guess Pink Floyd does it and, or, uh, or you know, different people. But, uh, sure. And so I just put it on the website, just said, hey, we'll see if the fans wanted to see that. And it was overwhelming that that was, that was particularly what they'd like to see. And then, then they explicitly, we had some people interested in another record called Venus Al, but most uh, unanimously, everybody said, well, it'd be great if you come out and play Avi Music Con from start to finish. So I thought, well, okay. And, uh, you know, Tommy and Kyle were up for it and available. So that right. was a wonderful opportunity to do it. Right, right, absolutely. And how long is the tour lasting? How long are you out for? Nine weeks. Nine weeks total? Yes. Yeah. Right. right. That's, that's a long time to be out. Are you land pretty much every it night, is. or is it? Uh, you have a little space. Uh, we have there. seven nights off out of nine weeks, maybe a little more. Did we more. have that much? Yeah. It didn't wow. seem like that. that was about, yeah. yeah, it was about yes. six, six days on, one off, pretty much. Right. Yeah, it's right. been pretty much nonstop. Right. And they actually wanted it, there was offers to extend the tour, but I thought, oh, maybe not right now. <laughs> so I gotta go home and rook R and R or something. Right. Right. Yeah. I saw you do the, uh, the show at the NAM show. Back in uh, in January, you did a Fender event there where, where you guys seems played. like a lifetime ago. Yeah, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> a couple of months, but it really was really was awesome to uh, to see all the, the songs come together. So my first question is, what did you have to do to bring those songs back? Did you all have to go back and relearn them? Are they still fresh in your minds as far as putting together this this tour? We played them so often back in the old days that they were kind of in our DNA. I did have to go back and yeah. do a little touch up. What did I do here? What did I do there? Right and uh, get my gear together to make the sounds sound like it did back then. Right. But not a whole lot of preparation. I mean, we played them for six straight years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, did, we definitely did some rehearsing before, you know, just to kind of make sure we could go through. I mean, you know, some of the songs were, you know, easier to remember than others. I mean, there's a lot of those parts are kind of, they're cemented. They're just, like Kyle said, we played them so many times that it's just, you know, it's kind of like muscle memory. You just kind of, you know what's coming. Right. So, uh, but, uh, you know, we rehearsed for, you know, for a few weeks and uh, it started coming together pretty quickly, really. I mean, the first couple rehearsals were like, whoa, well, maybe we better listen to their record tomorrow before yeah. we come back, you know. <laughs> but but interesting done. enough, the first rehearsal is like, a lot of it was like Kyle said in our DNA and it's almost like, we could have gone and played that we night. Could. I mean, it would have been really loose and different. funky, but but <laughs> I, that's what thought, we were we rehearsed through it the first time, and it hadn't played that stuff in oh, 20 years. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And and it was like, if we had to, we could go do it tonight, you know, because it, it was kind of like in our DNA, you know. But but we had to like fill in the blanks and stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, we had a lot. I mean, even before that, we recorded the record, we had a lot of pre-roll with that material too. We probably were playing the majority of that material for two or three years before we recorded right, it. So I mean, right. it's a, that on top of how long we toured it afterwards, I mean, we definitely play those play those songs a few times. Right. Some of them more than others because we've revisited some of that material, you know, at different times. But all of it. I mean, I. I was trying to think, you know, some of those we haven't played. I haven't played East West. And oh, yeah. I had to go back and learn it. You know? yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess, yeah, that was my next question is, had you played everything from the album or were there songs that were not ever performed live? No, we played everything. Not everything. I, I think believe. we played everything live. but uh, At some juncture. Some more than others, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, certain ones kind of stayed in the repertoire after the, you know, we'd done other records and done other, other you know, other tours. Uh, Right, right, right. So stepping back to 1988, when you were beginning to, to work on the record, you had changed record labels. 
and you mentioned you've been playing some of the songs for two or three years. Was everything written before you went into the studio to record the album? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Maybe not. Uh, the song for George's acoustic piece, I think, was written during the time. Yeah. Okay. But the uh, all the, maybe uh, East West actually maybe was written right before we. Yeah, recorded. pretty soon. Pretty that was kind of a jam thing that we did, and yeah. it just turned into a yeah. song. But everything else, everything else we've been playing for a while. In fact. And the Cliffs of Dover was around even before Tones. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah. trademark. Trademark was older too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Right, right. So when you uh, when you write a song like that and you're arranging it, how complete is it when you bring it to the band? Do you have the whole thing mapped out, or does it start as an idea and you work on it together? Or how uh, how do you approach that? I think with this this uh, this group, it might be in, intentions of being mapped out. But the interesting thing is, it's more for just a to to capture the vibe and then it changes mm -hmm. you know right. Kyle and Tommy do their own thing you know and add to it and I think once you get the spirit of something then you then you you open up the possible avenues of interpretation because they all interpret the spirit of it or whatever you know? right but you know but a lot of this music was kind of jammy stuff we had done yeah i think in this stuff it was stuff y'all had kind of already constructed a lot of your parts anyhow because we've been playing it on the road and jamming to it and stuff so they'd already kind of figured out um, yeah I mean, some of that material was had been around since before i had played with eric and i was you know i'd learned it off of what the previous drummers had done and kind of done my own interpretation of, of how they had approached it you know so right um it just kind of it's, evolved over time. You pretty quickly know if it's not a part that's going to work <laughs> out the window. <laughs> yeah, they, they kind of reveal themselves pretty well, you know. Right. So when you say you've been playing it for that long, were you playing it on stage or were you playing it in uh, in rehearsals, in sound checks, or was it on stage? Stage. On stage, yeah, you were playing yeah. the songs Touring, live. Yeah. So you pretty much went in then with the songs kind of ready to record. Yeah. Right. But it was, uh, if I understand correctly, quite a process getting the album completed. Uh, working through uh, getting the sounds that you wanted and the performances. Yeah, I mean these guys cut this stuff relatively, really very fast. And then uh, we, I did keep a lot of the li we we cut the record live, and then I'd go back. Oh, this part right here, save that. That's was really smoking. You know, the drums and bass were fine. You know, whatever. But I'd go back and I I had to like. I went. I had. To, I just spent a long time going back in, trying to get the sound just right and the playing just right. And I'd intersperse the studio fix it stuff over what I kept that was live. And then I wanted to figure out ways to orchestrate and overdub. And so I had to sit in the studio and come up with ideas of what would I want the orchestration to do and stuff like that. You know. Right. Right. Now this was uh, on analog tape. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So oh, you're yes. all working. You know, there wasn't Pro Tools. There wasn't cut and paste. There wasn't move things around. So were you going more for, when you say you were taking uh, parts, were you w looking at larger sections or were you actually getting more microscopic in the Well, it depends. Like on Desert Rose, it was big sections. Um, High Landrons, big sections. Cliffs of Dover, uh, ironically enough, it was I, I really took piece by piece of that. I wanted to get a certain, I almost, it's almost like I was having to re I had to learn a certain style to play that song. It actually was like grabbing a rung on a ladder to go somewhere else because I, I couldn't, I kept hearing the playback going, no, that's, I mean, we actually uh, finished the tune and it was like, okay, it was all done and I'd scrap the whole thing because it was like, it wasn't, I had to like learn a certain way of playing the song to kind of make that speak like it did, you know? It's kind of a subtle thing that, who knows, maybe people resonated to that, although you would say, no, that doesn't matter, but maybe, you know, subliminally it does. You know, all those little finer points where you're going for a certain, you know what I mean, kind of thing. Sure. But I remember you came in and overdubbed the, the bass, right? Right, right. But you just nailed it, like, first in take. I think you just played it all the way through. <laughs> I'm watching him do that in five minutes, and then I go, you know, spend the next three months doing it. <laughs> you know? But I mean, a lot of these, a lot of the parts were, you know, just cut live with bass and drums. I think, you know, we did do some edits of, uh, you know, the half of one take on another. As far as the basic, drums yeah, and stuff. not too, not too many on that record is, uh, that I recall. But some of, you know, some of we we certainly did. You know, we had like two two basics, and really maybe the first half was better than the second half, and the second yeah. half of another one was better. So we just splashed them together. But sure. you know. Uh, you know, they weren't. Most of that stuff wasn't cut to a grid or anything, so it's just kind of relative, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Which you, were you cutting to a click, to a metronome? Not much. Some, Not much. some were. I don't think, I'm just trying to think what we did to cut. I know we cut Desert Rose to a click because I remember specifically doing it and being amazed that we could play that to a click because it's just not that kind of a song. It's like, wow, this is so easy to play to a click, and sometimes things aren't. But I can't remember. Uh, Steve's well, Boogie. Wait, Steve's Boogie, we cut yeah, to a click. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you say that you, you scrapped songs and went back and started over again, did that include the drums and the bass, or were you just taking your parts off and relaying? Uh, no, no, like on, well, I, the one that I think of in particular was Cliffs. No, it was the same drum track, but I did all the guitar parts, and the tone was just not right. It didn't, it didn't speak. It was like, and, and uh, so I just redid the, I just, I actually had to go to another studio because the studio I was working at, the console, you know, had the a great sound for like clean rhythm stuff. But when I was running distortion through it, it was just kind of trashy sound. And so I finished the whole song. <laughs> and, oh, and by the way, that, you know, Richard Mullen was the engineer on, on the record who was priceless in, in doing that record. He was there almost all the time doing an excellent job of, being on the record, but um, uh, he worked with Stevie Ray on his first couple of records, and then we worked together for many years, and he, just a real genius uh, musician and uh, uh, in, uh, helpful, you know, co-producer and stuff, but I remember we finished the whole Clissa Dover, and we were listening to playback, and I went, well, that's just not it. We're going to have to start over, <laughs> and he just looked at me like, oh, we just finished the song. We're gonna, but you know, it just—it it just wanted to. I just wanted it to have this thing, you know. And and I knew I heard it in my head, but I would just couldn't get it. And I kept having to try and try to get it, mm -hmm. which was kind of the premise for a lot of the guitar work on Obby Music. Come, I mean, you you could probably find guys on YouTube that could play it as good, if not better, than me. You know, I mean, and they're probably only eight years old. <laughs> but at the time, it was like it was it was daunting for me to try to play at that level. And and I think when you get out of the way of yourself, it can happen. Mm -hmm. But you know, left to your own devices, sometimes you're struggling. Unless you're you know just a you know genius musician that's always on, which I'm not really at all. But so there would be moments where, like on Desert Rose, a lot of that's live lead, and and we kept it. Yeah. And a lot of it's kind of funky and red, but it's real Hendrixy and yeah. stuff. Anytime, and I think whenever we listened back to playback, whenever we heard stuff, it was like, oh, that section's magic. You right. Know? I would, I wouldn't touch that. I'd just punch in. I'd like, you know, I'm leaving that. That was magic. Right. Right. But then there'd be places where I'd get off time or or the tone, you know. Not, but. And I remember when we cut Cliffs live, it just, it, interestingly enough, I never knew Cliffs would be a, a hit song. And, and I, don't, I don't think that, I, I think that, that, that having it, you know, working it, trying to get to that place where it had a certain speaking personality to the guitar, which I had to work at to get, I think it maybe in a way it played into it being more um, sonically pleasing to people, you know, because otherwise it would have maybe just been a, you know, just a, a guitar instrumental thing, or you know what I mean? Like, it, it, I wanted the guitar to speak like a voice, where it was real, oh, you know, and I wasn't getting there, that's so I had to do it over and over. But when we cut that live, you know, we, we got the drum track, and then Kyle had to come back in and play to the guitar I put on there, because I had changed the song, but. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, you know, the thing, it's just interesting because that, that song was around. I mean, that, it, it, it was supposed to go on the first record, and serendipitously it didn't go on the first record because that record didn't get very much, um, you know, very much um, uh, visibility. Uh, it was supposed to be on tones, and the producer didn't really care for the tune that much. So oh, I know they said it. Right. Yeah. Well, we were, as we, were, we were rehearsing it at, at SIR and, and in L.A. For, to rehearse tones, and... Uh, our producer David Tickle, Eric was like going, okay, you know, we've run down the tunes. He goes, well, what about Clissy Dover? He goes, oh, I don't think we'll put that on the record. And it's like, well, why? He says, oh, Eric, I think it sounds like a game show thing. <laughs> 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 so, Lucky for us. <laughs> well, yeah, right. I mean, but, but I mean, you know, it, it's just funny, but, but it's something, you know, sometimes those things happen. They're, they're like, you don't really understand why things are being orchestrated in the creation the way they are. But it's like that record, if that song had been cut for tones, then it might not have ever, it might, we might, might not have had the success that we had because it was held and it ended up being on Avi Music Comp. Right. And like you're saying, you're, it's like, I know this isn't right. I know this isn't right. It's like, well, but the reason it's not right is because it's not the way it's supposed to be to make yeah. for the whole success thing. Yeah. You know, it's like you knew there was something in, subliminally that needed to be more than it was, yeah. you know, even though we didn't expect, we, 
who would have thought oh, that, yeah, that, 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 that an know, instrumental like single would yeah. would even come out, much less be right, right, you know a right. hit. You know, yeah, right? Yeah. You had three singles from that, three instrumental yes. singles, "Righteous" and "Trademark," that also yeah, got into the, the, the top of the charts, which I don't think any other artist has ever uh, ever done that. So that's Not, a, yeah. That's I mean, amazing Cliff's thing, Over yeah. was the first top ten uh, instrumental since Frankenstein. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And then the second was two instrumentals in Billboard charts from a band, and then three. Right. So it was like record after record. Yeah. And like, wow, okay. Yeah. And the yeah I don't know how that happened, I guess. <laughs> there, was, there was a moment in time where everybody went surf, I guess. You know, yeah. For 30 minutes, everybody went surf. That kind of. Right, kinda. right. So you mentioned, uh, Kyle, that you had to come back in and re-record the parts because things had changed with the guitar parts. Mm -hmm, yeah. How challenging was that, having played the songs for two or three years, to then come in and have to modify your approach to it? Actually, I came in and did my approach to it that I'd been doing on stage. And okay. they, they tried with a different bass player, and you know, maybe my part didn't work when we were in the studio. So I got another shot to try to do it, and it worked. Right. Yeah, and I, I can play with the band in the studio, and it's pretty good. But if I can go back in the studio and then play to the band coming out of the monitors, I can get a lot more precise and clean. You know, tend to overplay when uh, the whole thing's going on at one time. You know, you're. Right. you're trying to get the vibe, you know, you're not trying to get the exact tone. Right. Were you recording those bass parts direct or were you miking up an amplifier? Both. Both? Both, yes. Okay. And what about the drums? Primarily room mics, overheads, were you using more direct well, we spot mics? Mostly close mics. Mm -hmm. um, the, the studio we cut most of this, we, all the basics on that record is, is Arlen Studios in Austin and it's really, I was talking to uh, somebody yesterday, you know, it was a it's, it was kind of a, a, a reformatted kitchen from an old hotel. I mean, and so it's got those square brown hotel kitchen tiles on the floor and you know, one wall is kind of brick. And it's not really, I mean, it's not a, uh, it wasn't a super glamorous, it's, it's a great studio. I love working at Arlen and, and uh, but it, it, you know, it wasn't nearly as she, she modern, fixed up, full blown. I mean, it was, it was a, a good quality studio and, and had good gear. And, 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 but the cutting room was left kind of natural because it worked. And, uh, but we were all, I mean, I was playing, all of Eric's amps were on 10 on the wall right beside me, you know. I mean, I'm in there. And then, and the bass, I think we had in the, in the, you did have in, a the room in the little that. room in, in the, in the ISO room. But so it's full on. Um, I don't, it was pretty standard setup. We, we weren't too extravagant with having a lot of extra open miking and stuff in those days. It was, it's really pretty much close mic'd and, and uh, you know, a couple of overheads and that's it, you know, kind of a standard setup. Just, you know, snare, kick, toms and two overheads and we're done, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Was that a 16 track or 24 track studio that you were working on in those days? We did, uh, it was well, 16. 16. We did two, yeah. it's actually, we used two 16 tracks mm -hmm. synced eventually. We, you know, used the first and then ran it over to a Slave Master. But that was, we, we started out actually because uh, our friend Steve Hennig, that Steve's boogie was you know, you know, taken from, um, he had that uh, those 3M machines like we used on the Christopher Crosser, and he brought that down. And there's an API console in there that was a really great sounding board. But those two together, it wasn't a good mix. It was really soggy and really slow. And so I guess we ended up using the, we got a, a, a I just when I, uh, yeah, I found a used MCI, MCI 24 track machine at the time, which are so pricey, you know, now you could get them for $3,500. Three, $3, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but yeah, but it had, but it, we had both head stacks and, and yeah. we used the 16 track because you, you got, you know, you got more tape space per, per, per track. That so way. there was a second 16 track on, on I didn't know that. Well, yeah, it's a slave, slave master. And when we mix the final, it's two sixteen oh, okay. sinks. Yeah. I didn't know that. Hmm. I forgot about that. Yeah, right, right. Right, yeah, that makes it more challenging when you're trying to lock two God, analog I mean, decks we, together. You know, we, if, we, if we tried to do it all on 16, we would have never made it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> right. It's all done where you're having to punch by hand. You're like, no, 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 Right, know. yeah. But and that's uh, a, that can be uh, exciting when you're doing that on an analog master. 
Because if you punch in the wrong spot, you can yeah. chop off well, the end of it. Well, then you're done. No do, there's right? no going back. It's erased. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not yeah. like the day where you go, oh, well, let's just go back and drag it back from the last pass. It's not there anymore. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Did uh, you have problems with, uh, given the fact that you went back and reworked some of the things and did a lot of overdubs, with the tape actually shedding and losing the... Uh, well, that's why we had the slave, you know, the, 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 you know, we cut the basics with the drums. Probably, I guess Richard probably used eight. I'm thinking eight. That's the number that comes to mind, eight tracks for drums. And then, you know, we... As memory serves, that you know they they'd work on that, and that would be basically the basic tracks. It wouldn't be like you know stuff that you were going to you know try and capture over and over again. And then he'd he'd mold that down to like a two mix and and send it over to a slave master. So we're run, we're we're real, we're not really spinning the basic track all the time. You got the basic track mixed to two, and then you're spinning. You know this is the the tape that's getting all the passes on it. So right, right. So you're um, pres preserving those original tapes. Yeah, yeah. And then bringing them back during yeah, the final yeah. final mix now. Right. Right. And what was the approach to miking the guitar? Oh man, you know, th and that was another thing that took a, a while on that record was trying to figure out a system to mic my guitars and how to get how to get my stuff to sound good on tape. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I learned a lot on that record. Uh, I ended up just using an old script logo 57 for close and sometimes a condenser mic for room. Okay. But there was a certain deflection angle. I, it'd be like at a little bit of an angle, and I'd get like a little bit off the cone, and I'd move it, uh, or dust cover rather. I'd move it closer to the dust cover. I wanted more treble and that kind of thing. And right. <laughs> we, I got the perfect place. I remember that when we were recording the record, I got it, and Richard told me this story. It was hilarious. But we were at Riverside doing yeah. overdubs, right. and I was right in the middle of working on one of the tunes with the lead. And I, 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 I mean, I, I had spent like a day getting the mic in the perfect place where you just you get this kind of alchemical sweet spot where it's like, oh, that sounds great, you know. Right, and right. he brought some friends to the studio on my one day off that that week, and they had a four-year-old son. And he said when they came in the studio that the the, the first thing the son did was he ran right over to the mic right in front of the cabinet and moved it. And, and Richard just was like, of all the things he did, the first thing he said, he just ran in there and took the mic and moved. <laughs> and, and, it was, and Richard was just like, oh, why? <laughs> so that was funny. Anyway, but, uh, yeah. So another day then to place it back where? Uh, yeah, where trying to figure out. It, Richard, I think he kind of remembered where it went, but that, that was hilarious. <laughs> it, just, it was like meant to be. It's like the, it was meant that that kid was going to go in a wreck. Yeah, right. yeah, right, totally. Right. Yeah. And primarily Fender and Marshall amps? Yeah, that, well, and Dumbles. And Dumbles as well. Mm -hmm. Which are wonderful amps, you know. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the individual songs that are on the, uh, on the record and your, your memories of, of doing those. You open up with Avia Musicom. Was that originally part of your vision for the record, to have that kind of opening, airy lead in to the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the record? Or when did that come into the process? I don't know. I think it was just some. Uh, uh, we were just jamming in the studio, and we had all this crazy stuff going on, just like playing. And then we, I thought it'd be neat to have an overture, and literally just cut pieces of tape together. Richard and I were in the studio, and said, "Oh, this is a nice jam. Uh, okay, when you put this piece of tape in, flip it around the other way." Right. So they literally would that that if you listen to the basic tracks, album, it'd be like forward tape, backwards tape backwards, forwards, kind of like, you know, the Beatles did that years sure, before, sure. just kind of mix, mash stuff and get this, that created the bed, and then um, Steve Barber came in, a uh, keyboard, great keyboard player, and he did this real kind of thing, you know, right. uh, sound, and then I took a shortwave radio, and, and then we had a, a percussionist Crusher, from yeah, UT guy. come yeah. in, and um, just kind of wacky, you know, we just, we were having fun. Sure. And then uh, it, it just kind of serendipitously worked out. We thought, oh, you know that feedback note right there. Let's just cut the tape right there. And and um, and so we cut the tape to silent tape and mixed it. And then when we went to Bernie Grubbins mastering, he put it together with the first note of Cl Clarissa Dover. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a Fairlight or a D50 or something doing those airy keyboard pad. I think kind of it was a D50. Yeah. Kind of wow. Forgot yeah. all about D50. That are that are working in there. Yeah. yeah I think, that's what yeah, I think it, was. it was a D50. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty good ear. Yeah. 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 So that leads into Cliffs of Dover, and uh, you mentioned that you actually connected those in, at the mastering stage later. But talk a little bit about the process of recording that. You mentioned you know going after different tones and things, but what do you guys recall about the actual recording of that song? 
Well, we got. To, uh, we, did we? Did we do? The, we did like two different sessions of the record, I guess. Yeah. And I can't remember. We were. Reco- we just recorded it, and then I took the tapes off, and you know, worked on the guitars and stuff. And, yeah, I don't really remember. I mean, it's, it's it's like that song became so significant. At the time, it was just another song. I don't even remember anything about no, recording. No, I, I mean, I remember cutting Highlander and Steve's oh, yeah. trademark. I can remember. Yeah, I, tr- I can remember cutting that that and Desert Rose. I remember all those, but but Clifford Over. I don't just, even remember just where song. we recorded. I don't. I don't remember <laughs> recording Cliffs. No, I don't even remember being there. <laughs> yeah. I, I would assume you didn't record the songs in the order that they ended up on the album. No, or just no, done no, as, you were, all, as you were doing whatever. What would lead you to choose to record a particular song at a particular time? To say that, okay, now we're going to do Desert Rose. Now we're going to do... I have no idea, you know. I guess maybe those were just the songs we were playing at the time. They were left over from the Tones thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't think. I don't know why we would. You know, like, oh, today we're going to do Cliffs It Over. I mean, the first song we started out with was 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 was, was Righteous, because seemingly we thought it would be an easy song to get. It wasn't very easy to get actually. It took a long time to try and get that song. You know, so. Right, right. So next up on the album would be Desert Rose. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's that was a session where we're it was Roscoe Beck and and myself and Eric playing and I, I don't know what we've been doing the day before. I just remember we came, you know, the the schedule kind of started getting later and later. And so we're not really daytime people in those days. And so you know we were just like, okay, well, so you know we might show up and he'd come in a little earlier and get his sounds because you know he get the amps warmed up and, and get get you know real free to play and everything. And then I don't know. It seems like you were not there i have a visit because i just remember it was just like i, I was always was amazed that we we for some reason we we put a click track up and i was just playing the part to the click track and roscoe came in and was playing bass and it's like you know i you know kind of commensurate with him he's like it sounds sounds pretty good we maybe we ought to try and cut us the click track. I said, so i'm not having any problem doing this and, and so maybe we should so I remember that much of it, and then I, all I remember is that when we cut it, we I don't think there's even very many takes of that. I think that one was, went pretty fast, surprisingly, and I just remember that one, that all that lead stuff, and that that is just, it was just like very off the cuff and just like out of this world. He was over there getting feedback, and it was live, and it's like a like a regular show, and it's like we listened back to him like. Wow! Except for that little blip at the end, you know, it's like that's amazing. That was that's what we've been trying to capture on tape for years. That we've never been able to get that kind of effect with that live, just killer, uh, spontaneous energy. And and so you know, we we kept it. You know. Nice, nice. Next up would be Highlanders, and tell us about that. Um. It was yeah, an all-nighter. We, <laughs> yeah, we cut that at sunup, you were saying. Right yeah, I remember studios. being, I remember looking, because there's a part of Arlen where there's a vocal booth and there's a window, and it's, it's to my left, um, and, and I could see, I, I was like, <laughs> the sun's coming up. It must have been like 7 in the morning, we were finally getting, we've been probably been playing it all night long trying to get, you know, that, that take, you know, mm-hmm. and... I mean, that's the one we kept, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, we finally said, oh, yeah, that's it. Cool. <laughs> we can go to bed. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But it probably took that long for us to get the uh, uh, enough, because there's a kind of a slunkiness to that track that you kind of, you can't be edgy. It's got to have an edge, but you've got to kind of have that kind of really loose kind of mm. feel. It probably took us, you know, six hours of playing it to get to where we're tired enough to make that happen. You know, maybe, yeah. I we kept, kept some of the live guitar on that, but I remember I wanted to outdo that live guitar with the rest of it being like super house burning down by Hendrix, you know, right. uh, Electric Leyland, and that was a, that just almost drove me over the edge trying to get that sound, like setting up the flan. I ended up having to use two flangers and an echo to get it set just right where they'd cross, the combing would cross. It was, right. it was crazy, actually. Yeah, I remember breaking for dinner and you'd come back and it was just completely opposite change. Yeah, and then yeah. you'd have to redial wow. it in. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like you couldn't stop, it Pretty would insane. never stay the same. Right, because yeah. those clocks were traveling at yeah, different the times and they'd get out of sync and then it almost sounded like no flanger at all. Yeah, you know? yeah it was, uh, <laughs> there, it was, there was a lot of challenging times making, trying to, for me to try to reach sonically and, and uh, technically up to what I was trying to do on that record. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fun stuff though. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's good. I learned a lot from it. Sure, yeah. sure. So we would have Steve's Boogie would be the next song. 
Oh, and I mean, we do we we, we cut that in the big room. Why did we do that? We we uh, like man, we took a two hundred just been foot, bored. But we know? took a two hundred foot snake and didn't we and cut like some. Well, right. Else? Okay, we're okay, in like a, a, a cafeteria setting kind of almost right. without the tables. <laughs> well, the old yeah the the, the, the uh, Arlen Recording Studios uh, Studios is built in a in, like I said in the old kitchen area of the Terrace Summer House Hotel, which is where the Austin Opera House was. Uh, they'd taken the the Terra Summer House ballroom and turned that into a into a into a venue, and then there was these these big like conference rooms in between there and the ballroom, and so we said. Oh, I don't know why we did that. We all decided we were going to go out of the studio and go set up in the ballroom. I mean, not in the ballroom, but in the conference room with this snake. But that's the see, that's the same. That's where Stevie and, and Chris and Tommy and, and Reese cut Live Alive. They played on the Opera House stage and they had the snake and into the Arlen recording uh, 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 control room. So we, this, this setup was already there. So we just kind of dropped the snake through the ceiling and we're in there. Steve's boogie runners is so hard to get in the click tracks. That's when we're cutting to a click track because we really needed to nail that it tempo because it's got to be straight. It's like, the, you know. yeah, the click but, track. I remember <laughs> putting on the headphones and it was so incredibly loud. I went, there's no well, way we can do that. You know, but, but then once the drum started, it was like I couldn't tell the click track from the snare. It right. was just. But I think the two is like you know we weren't it was it's not very extravagant you know of a of a situation there the studio was relatively new and the board had kind of just been put in there uh, a few months or so and 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 it, it doesn't have a really fancy monitoring uh, you know uh, section so I mean there probably was only maybe two headphone mixes of that and he was stuck with mine and I've got to hear the click truck so loud right. it's like <laughs> you know freaking out but I remember like we you know <laughs> Stuart Sullivan he's, he owns wire recording in Austin now he was the the, uh, the assistant engineer there and he finally got me a set of headphones that I could throw that had that came unplugged so I would stop ripping the wire out of the headphones because I mean like, we'd stop because ah! they wouldn't turn the click off because they're not hearing it they're not listening. I'm going, I'm going, wow, and I took and throw the headphones and the cord and rip out. <laughs> and then we go in and listen to the playback and there wouldn't be any top end on it because we had so much cable. Going. It was like we were running 200 <laughs> feet of this stuff. I mean, even, even low impedance, if you run crazy, and it's like it didn't sound quite the same. It's like, why does that? Because y'all are running 200 feet. Well, I, I don't know. I don't have no idea why. I, and did we, I don't think we cut anything else in that room. I don't know why we were. Oh, I, don't I can't know remember. How we got but I ended there. up, and then I overdubbed the guitar. I yeah. borrowed uh, my friend Park Street had a 52 Tele, and I didn't own a Telecaster, and I was figured I wanted a more of a, a Tele sound on it. So I borrowed his guitar and. Right. Which was a great guitar. I'm not, and then he was selling it. I'm not sure why I didn't buy that. <laughs> you know, you think back about those things. Like, yeah, oh, Eric, I'm gonna sell that 52 Tele. I'll 800 bucks. I'm like, mm. no, I'm not really a Tele player. It's like, well, you played on the record, and it was a great guitar, and it's not a lot. Of, you know, it's like yeah. I should have got it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> one of those, you know. I'm yep. sure everybody's got those. Oh, sure, know? the one that got away, right? I had a chance to buy the Maltese Falcon for a dollar, and I turned it down. <laughs> you know? But whatever. But yeah, I used. I, I remember. I, but I used that track. That yeah. We recorded. I mean. Yeah. 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 And did so, and where and where did so did Steve come down to your yeah, studio? Yeah. And then Steve Henning played. Uh, has this amazing pedal guitar. It's like a regular guitar, but it has it has pull pull wires he on it to be like it, yeah. a pedal steel. Right. So that when you hear that solo in the middle, that's Steve Henning playing a pedal guitar. It sounds like a steel guitar, but it's actually right. Right. Awesome. So next would be trademark. Yeah. Yeah, what do, we, what do you remember, recall about that uh, song? We cut it at Arlen. Yeah, we cut it at Arlen. Kind of, I yeah. kept a good deal of that live guitar. Yeah, I, I don't remember, I mean, I don't think it was, it wasn't, I don't recall that one being terribly difficult to get. No, that, I don't think that's it was a wonderful easy. song to play, and it, 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 for some reason, it just always falls together really, yeah. really well. Even today, live, it's just, it's great. I just remember when I heard it back, because, you know, it's, it's strange, because you, we work in a trio format. And I mean, even though Eric's got a plethora of sounds out there that he manages to somehow dovetail and make all happen at once in a live show, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think conceptually I really ever um, fully grokked what he was going for with Trademark until I heard the playback of the finished mix. And I was just like, I get it. Wow. I, mean, I was so blown away by the whole sonic spectrum of what he had orchestrated on that particular song. It was just amazing it's like now i see why you wanted this to go here and that to go here and that because you heard it all this way and now we're hearing it back oh okay right no great 
Right. I mean, three piece live, it's like you kind of go like, well, well, I don't know if sure exactly why that needs to be like that, but you know, it makes sense when you hear it finally, you know? Yeah, yeah. I do remember going in and touching up a couple of parts, but I think the song as a whole was just straight through. Mm -hmm. yeah. There weren't any cutting of tapes no, that I, I know that was of. a pretty good, pretty good, pretty yeah, there wasn't, I didn't know edits on that one. No, I think it's pretty safe. That was a pretty safe track. It was great. I mean, it was easy to cut. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, Nothing Can Keep Me From You would be the next one. And you've talked about your guitar recording, but you don't talk a lot about your vocal recording. Um, yeah, well, the Nothing Can Keep Me From You, interestingly enough, we, we had an eight-track Tascam version of that from the practice house. It was yeah. really that really was the cool. demos actually part of the demos to, the demo. to get the second deal and so we cut the song and it's like yeah this is cool but for some reason the end there, there's a section at the end like a reprise where it just kind of goes off and goes just into this crazy jam and the one from the studio never had the same it's just, um, just trying to beat the demo it's it's, it's born to run syndrome yeah you so know? We, it, uh, we actually edited the ending jam rave up section of the of the demo on to the original uh, to the studio recording. So what you hear on the record, once it ends the song body and starts that long jam at the or sh jam at the end, that's all an edited uh, Tascam demo from the for, studio. Uh, yeah, oh, and, and okay. actually that's that's Reggie Witty is playing on the on the reprise yeah. section because he had done the de demo with uh -huh. us back. <laughs> Whenever God, we did that a million years ago, and that right. that recording situation was really sketchy. We were in a, in a little rehearsal studio in the same building where Arlen was, in this tiny room that we shared with Van Wilkes, another great guitar player from Austin. It was like seven foot ceiling, carpet on the walls. It's like this thing where yeah. <laughs> Eric's got all his gear, the full Marshalls and yeah, the dumpling, everything crazy. on tin. Right. You know, and One we're little sitting there, window unit. We're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're sitting. Yeah, we're sitting. We can't run the window unit while recording, and it's like a million degrees in there. And I've I've got this drum set set up with my back to this this there, I guess there's a there's a, there was a glass window where somebody had thought about making a control room and our, our live sound engineer Dave Parks is in there with the Tascam 8 track recording this and the only thing separating him from us is a sheet you know on a door you know and, and you know and Reggie set up there and we're just I mean it's just it's as loud as our live show in there except the room is it's not as big as what we're sitting in right now I promise right. you you yeah, know it's right. crazy it's all right incredible so two more I have to ask you about. One is uh, Song for George and the other is East West. And the reason that I really want to ask you about those is this album has a diversity of styles that few players and few bands really approach. Maybe Steve Morse would do those kind of, you know, where you have a country song and a jazz song. And a... So tell me about shifting your mindset to do Song for George and East West versus something like Cliffs of Dover. They wouldn't happen on the same day. Okay. No, they, yeah, everything would be set. Eric would get his tone for a certain song we may work all day all night the next day or right on that then, style yeah on I'm that certain. on that one song and then reset up all his tones for like east west and we'd do that and that was actually done in several different studios you know, i did my bass part or at least touch up bass parts at riverside sound yeah i did i did the basic for the drums on east west was done at arlen uh, same, same, same time frame as the rest of them. Um, yeah, not as much changing gears as just changing days. Changing days, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah. Or weeks. Yeah. Right. How long a period did you record the album over? It was about a year, wasn't it? What well, the, the basics? I think really there were the basic tracks. Uh, oh, the basic tracks were a couple, couple track. of two week sessions right. probably yeah. was for that. You know? And then I spent a year working on it right, after that, right, just right. messing yeah. with it. And right. song for George. Uh, and then, but we did do a few. Uh, did a little bit. Of, we'd go out and play some tours. Oh yeah, we're we're, we're having to support ourselves at the same time, and we couldn't just record all. We didn't have the budget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that record started out on an independent label. It wasn't on Capitol. It was on Cinema Records, and that's you know there ended up being the kind of the, the uh, executive production company. We didn't have any money, nothing compared to what we had on to start with tones. I mean, we were just lucky to even be in the yeah. studio. Yeah. In fact, we went in the studio on spec to start with, we didn't have a record contract. We just went in there because Freddie Fletcher was kind enough to let us go in there and record, you know, yeah. with those like, yeah, you pay me sometime. All right. Um, right. There had to be some pressure going into those sessions because you had come off of, I remember the, the cover of Guitar Player, who was Eric Johnson and YZ on our cover, and the sound page that was in there, and obviously there was a lot of uh, tones came out and there was a lot of critical acclaim and players were really jumping onto what you guys were doing. Did you feel a lot of pressure going into Avia Musicom? 
You know, I, I think, yeah, I did. Um, I think you always feel that a little bit, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, what I did feel was that I, I was kind of very, um, in a very somewhat kind way, kind of dropped from Warner Brothers. They, they basically, they didn't, they, did, they said, you know, we'd rather you go somewhere else because we don't know what to do with you and we, we just don't know how to continue here. So if you don't mind, could you go find another record deal? You know, I guess they, I guess I was dropped. Maybe it, it wasn't anything kind, but they were kind of by the way they said Well, it. I think the thing is that they, they had an option and they let it lapse. They let and, it then, and then, but at, you know, at the, at, the, at the midnight hour, they were still kind of negotiating back and forth with Joe to try and, and 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 keep. But Eric they weren't really. Uh, their heart wasn't in it. They were kind of like. Well, we, I think you know, I think Michael's was, but he. I don't think he really. I think he, you're right. I think they were going like, well, we don't really know what to do with this, but we we know Eric's wonderful, and we you know, but we want it, but we don't know what to do with it, so we don't want it. And, and, I, and maybe some of it was my own doing, because I remember the process with Warner Brothers. There was always a, a push to try to how can we turn this into a pop thing? You know, check out this check out this pop record, check out how can we, you know, and I think it, it uh, you know, nothing wrong with, with not wanting to do that, which I didn't want to do, but I think my response was not as tactful as it could have been, you know, I was 34 years old and I was more like, oh, I got my music, gotta, you know what I mean, and so I, I kind of, it kind of got to the point after two years of that where I think maybe, maybe I, I had a little bit of an attitude about the fact that they consistently they really didn't really understand, they didn't really want to embrace the idea of, of, well, let's try, okay, let's make it, try to make it successful, let's try to do something different or whatever. It was more like, how can we get this into this mainstream thing, which, you know, is almost like, how, how can you turn an apple into something else or something, sure, you know? So sure. I think maybe some of their, some of their uh, you know, uh, uh, ambivalence came from me just getting frustrated with them. You know, I, maybe I fed back frustration to them at the same time they were feeding frustration. So maybe some of it was my own part, but whatever it was, it was, it got to the point where there was like whatever. So, you know, you talk, you know, you're saying about having a, the pressure, you know, it's like, and I knew then I thought, well, okay, here it is, no record deal. And here you trying to, you know, and it's like, I got to do something that's really, I, I, I got to figure out what it is in my head that I think would be something really, solid and and i i building that vision and just going for it so yeah it, it, there was that pressure and trying to pull up to another rung in a way you know right. on the ladder and, i think and, i think too the you know the 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 tones record has a real unique style and a real unique approach it worked with the material that we were doing and but i think that you know um it, it varied a bit from the way we were presenting those tunes live, and a lot of the fans were like, well, that doesn't sound like what you sound like. And it was kind of like, well, yeah, but it's great. Don't you dig it? And they were, yeah, we do. Yeah, but where's the blow up? You know, I mean, we had Zap and Eric really, you know, we, we, we basically, you know, kind of tore everything down and went out and all got in the same room together and just blew and tried to make that just as big as we could. But so the, the key for me was, okay, I've got to, we, we've got these songs and we're kind of, we're kind of solid on that. On the, on, the, on the more amped up tunes, it's like, we gotta throw everything to the wind and try to get some tracks that are gonna make him play over the top blow up guitar because that's what the audience is used to hearing and that's what is, we have a great fan base, but that's what's gonna convince the other people that don't know who we are that this is what they wanna be listening to. And so, I mean, that was the attitude I went in. It was like, man, we just got to, we got to cook on this record. It, 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 tones was maybe too subtle in a way. I love the record, but it, I mean, at, at first glance, people might go, yeah, I'm not, it's not, it's not tickling my ear. We need some, something, you know, where you're just you're yeah. going to be hit over the head with it. Like, wow, I can't not listen to this. So, right, right. You know. Right. right. Guys, thanks so much for taking time today to sit down and, and revisit. Awesome. It's an incredible album, certainly one of my favorites, and I know for a lot of other people as well. And the success of it obviously speaks for itself. So. So uh, congratulations on the tour. It's great to have you back here at Sweetwater. Thank you. Thank Good you. to see thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having Tommy, us. Kyle, and Eric, we appreciate you. Awesome. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.